You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, host of World Class and director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. President Biden has officially taken office, and today we'll be talking about the new administration's approach to Russia and what we might expect to see between Washington and the Kremlin going forward. My guest today is Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer. He was the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine from 1998 to 2000, and he's now a research fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. But he's still with us. I want to emphasize that. He's just away for a little while. He'll be back on campus here, I think, after some time in the summer. His work focuses on nuclear arms control, Ukraine, Russia, and European security. He had many jobs in the U.S. government uh, related to all of these issues before stepping down and before joining us. But today we're going to focus on U.S.-Russian relations in the Biden administration, and in particular, I hope about the possibility of strategic stability talks. Thanks, Steve, for joining the program again. Oh, I'm happy to be here, Mike. So most pundits in Russia appear to assume that the Biden presidency will mean a continuation of the current bad relationship between Washington and Moscow. Some even predict increased tensions. What do you think are the differences that you see so far, Steve, between Biden's prospective Russia policy and what we've had for the last four years? Well, let me begin with the observation that the Kremlin liked President Trump because from their perspective, he sowed division within the United States, he disrupted alliances, and he blemished the American image abroad. So if you're Vladimir Putin, if you're the Kremlin, what's not to like? But on the flip side, I would argue, if you look at the four years of the Trump's presidency, it did nothing positive of consequence for U.S.-Russia relations. Right. And I think Biden could bring a change. We're not talking about a reset here, but several aspects of, I think, the Biden approach. And that is, in addition to being prepared to deter, to push back when the Russians misbehave, you're going to see in Biden and his presidency an administration where the president and the policy are in sync. I think the hardest job in the last four years in Moscow was being the America watcher in the Kremlin, because how could you explain to Putin, President Trump, who talks about having good relations with Putin, never criticizes Russia, but then seeing a policy that was actually fairly tough. Right. With President Biden, the policy and the president will be in sync. The Russians are not going to like every aspect of that policy, but they'll understand it. It will be predictable. And I think that's a positive. Second, I I think that President Biden will professionalize the dialogue. It's not going to be just go in and get together over lunch and see what we could throw together. I mean, when he meets Putin, and at some point, I think there will be that meeting, I would expect it to be prepared. There's going to be an agenda and Biden will do his homework. So he'll be able to deal with issues. Right. And on some questions, the Russians are going to find that President Biden is prepared to cooperate. He wants some guardrails on the adversarial aspects of the relationship, arms control. And we've already seen the report that says the White House has communicated to the Russians that it wants to extend the New START Treaty now for a full five years. So there will be some areas, I think, where interests converge where they can work together. And it's going to be a relationship where there'll be pushback, there's going to be problem issues, but I think there's also going to be a more serious dialogue than we've seen in the last four years. And, and that won't change things overnight but it could chip away at some of the tougher problems. Right. You mentioned President Biden at the top, and most certainly he's the most important foreign policy decision maker and most important uh, diplomat when it comes to great power relations. But Steve, tell us a little bit more about some of the people that have already been nominated and the team. I'm sure you know almost all of them. Tell us a little bit about how you think their approach towards Russia will differ or be the same as the previous team around President Trump. I think in some ways you're going to see some continuity because if you look at the Trump policy towards Russia and related issues, you had continued sanctions on Moscow, toughening of some sanctions. You had a continued effort to build up the American and NATO military presence in Central Europe and in the Baltic region. You had continued support for Ukraine. It's just not clear that President Trump ever really agreed with all of that. Right. So it's not going to be a huge change except this time you're going to have the policy where it'll be backed by the president. And and you're going to have people who I think are attuned to President Biden, certainly uh, Tony Blinken as Secretary of State, but also people who know Russia, Toria Newland as the Under Secretary of State. So there's going to be a lot of expertise, both at the State Department and at the um, White House. And I think we're going to see that as well at the Department of Defense, our own call and call going back to uh, be the Under Secretary of Defense for policy. Right. The experienced people, I think, who know how to shape the policy and can 
interpret and put into day-to-day practice the direction they get from President Biden. Interesting. Let's dive a little bit into arms control. You already mentioned that just today, I believe it was, that they've made formally the announcement, not only do they want to extend the New START Treaty, but they want to extend it by five years. There was a debate about whether they would seek a shorter term. It takes two to tango, right? So that's what's been declared. I want to hear first how easy you think that will be to get that extension with five years with the Russian government. And then second, What's beyond that? What do you think is the agenda for arms control, strategic stability talks beyond just signing and extending the New START Treaty? The extension of New START for five years should not be a difficult issue because the Russians have been on record now for more than a year as favoring New START extension. And in fact, I think even today in Moscow, they were repeating interest in that. So that should be a fairly easy thing to do. And I think it's very much in the American interest. First of all, it's good to have Russian strategic forces limited to until 2026. It's good that until 2026, we continue to get the information about Russian strategic forces from the data exchanges and notifications and inspections that are conducted under New START. And we don't have to change any American strategic modernization plans, which were all designed to fit within New START. So this seems to be a no-brainer to me, and I'm glad the Biden administration made that decision. As for what comes next, I think there's going to be a little bit of time, first of all, to figure out what comes next as people get into place. Right. It would make sense to my mind that the first thing ought to be is some kind of a strategic stability dialogue with the Russians, where you really talk about everything, nuclear arms reductions, and not just strategic, but non-strategic. You talk right. about the issues, third country nuclear forces, missile defense, conventional strikes, space cyber. And again, a lot of those issues are not going to lend themselves to an immediate no negotiation. But if you have detailed periodic talks, it's a chance to at least exchange concerns, better understand the other side. One area I think that probably will get to the point of an early negotiation is what comes after the new START treaty. And there it seems to me that the Biden administration has two choices. Choice number one would be to go for what I would call a new START true, where you're basically limiting strategic forces. You might include some of the new kinds that uh, the Russians or President Putin announced a couple of years ago, but it would look a lot like new START in terms of the limitations and the structure. Both sides would be familiar. Before you go to the second option, just to explain to our listeners, there are some strategic delivery vehicles that are not covered by the new START treaty. So that would be part of what would happen here? Or, or Systems like the Russians are developing this long range super torpedo, right. which would not be captured by current new start limits, but it does replicate what a strategic delivery system does. Got it. Got it. So that's what's to be done, right? Yeah. And people like you, Mike, very, you put it in the new start tree, there's actually a provision in there for discussion of new kinds. The second option, which I hope the administration would consider would be to be more ambitious. Okay. And that is to go for a U.S.-Russia agreement that would cover all nuclear weapons of the two countries, strategic, non-strategic, deployed, non-deployed. And that's going to be a much tougher negotiation. Uh, it'll involve problems like verification. The side right. would have to get in verification questions they've not had to deal with before. And th- there could be one other issue, which is, and this is a, a bit of a debate now going on, I think, in the arms control community. In the past, the Russians have seemed to say, look, if you Americans want to talk about all nuclear weapons, then you have to be prepared to talk about issues of interest to us. And usually at the top of that list has been missile defense, right? which has been a no-go area for the United States. Right. Some people think that the Russians may be falling off that linkage, which would be great. Most of the Russian experts that I talk to, though, say, no, if if we want to talk about Russian non-strategic nuclear weapons, we're going to have to talk about missile defense. Interesting. I think that's going to pose a question for the Biden administration is, is the American interest and the interest of our allies in getting limits on all nuclear weapons so strong that we should be prepared to countenance the idea of some limits on missile defense? I think there's some possibilities there, but that's going to be a difficult question. And it's also going to be a a politically hard question because on the Republican side in Congress, they're very set against the notion of any constraints on missile defense. But and then I guess speaking, there should be this, this dialogue about all these things in your view, right? Exactly. I mean, start that dialogue and then see what areas you could spin off to negotiations. But my guess is if we want to be ambitious and go for limits on all nuclear weapons between the United States and Russia, we're going to have to talk about some issues that we have preferred not to talk about in the last five right. or six years. Got it. And I should say, I mean, just to be realistic for a moment, I mean, that's a really ambitious, I, I think we should try for ambition, but we also ought to be realistic that these are difficult issues and at the end we may well fall short. 
Talk a little bit about the challenge that the new Biden team faces as they try to pursue, and let's just focus on New START because that's in the news and everybody's focused on it. They want to negotiate the extension. And at the same time, Mr. Putin and his government just arrested Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader. There's lots of discussion here in the United States and in Europe. I, well, you tell us, you're in Europe, so tell us what the, the discussion is there, but that there has to be some response to that. So how do you manage those two portfolios at the same time? I think you're going to have to find a balance. And, and this is, again, where the Biden administration will be capable of this in a way that Donald Trump was not. It right. is that you can find areas where there's a mutual agreement between the United States and Russia that it makes sense to contain aspects of our competition, particularly when it comes to nuclear weapons. But on the same time, there are going to be issues like Navalny, like Nord Stream 2, where there are differences and we're going to have conflict and tension there. I think the two sides should be able to do both. And in the, in the past, you know, we've seen that. I mean, you know, go back to the Reagan years where we were making progress with the uh, Soviets on intermediate range nuclear forces and strategic weapons and regional issues. At the same time, we we're sending uh, Stinger missiles to Afghanistan to shoot down Soviet aircraft. Well, that leads me to another question uh, related, but also separate, which is the triangular relationship between U.S.-Russia relations and U.S.-Ukraine relations and Ukraine-Russian relations. You have in President Biden, somebody who knows Ukraine probably better than any other president we've ever had. I traveled there once with him, by the way, in 2009 to Ukraine, and he's had many interactions over the years. You also had, I think, a pretty dark period, of especially the last two years, where U.S.-Ukrainian relations got politicized by Mr. Trump in ways that I think were detrimental to the relationship. So how does the new Biden team repair this relationship? How does the new Zelensky repair this relationship too, by the way? It takes two to tango. And how will that affect or not U.S.-Russian relations moving forward? Well, on the Ukrainian side, my, my sense is that the Ukrainians are very enthusiastic about President Biden because uh -huh. they know him. He was to Ukraine, as you said, six times. In fact, President Zelensky yesterday hosted the American Charge to his office so that they could watch the inauguration together. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's a signal. Yes, I, I, I I saw that on Twitter this morning. <laughs> and I think Biden is going to be very good for Ukraine, although Zelensky may not fully appreciate it. Biden, I think, is the kind of supporter that Ukraine needs right now, which is somebody who will be supportive, but is also going to be prepared to push Ukraine when it needs some pushing. Right. And unfortunately, I think at this point in time, uh, President Zelensky needs a bit of pushing because he, he went off the rails on reform over the last seven or eight months of 2020. And in the past, we've seen that then Vice President Biden was prepared to push when uh, his Ukrainian interlocutors were not prepared to take necessary moves on reform or on fighting corruption. So I think that will be good for Ukraine, even if there may be times where President Zelensky does not fully appreciate it. Interesting. I also wonder on the Russia-Ukraine angle, to date you've had for, well, since the last six year and a half years now, it's been a British-French effort to try to broker a solution between Russia and Ukraine on Donbass. And I wonder if at some point, I, I don't think this is something that would be urgent for President Biden, but would an American entry at the highest level change the game board there in a way that might make progress more likely? And I, I think looking at some of the questions, one thing that I don't think has been discussed enough or at all is it seems to me that the Russians are in Donbass, not just because of Donbass, but part of it is about where does Ukraine fit in Europe? It's a geopolitical question. Right. And I'm not sure you get that answer without the Americans at the table. So if President Biden decides to engage, I, you know, I would only advise that if people could say, yes, we think this leads to something useful in, in progress. Right. You know, but it's not going to be a one-off. It's going to be you know, a process that may take months or even a couple of years. But there is a possibility that you know, he could get involved there in a way that might help shake the thing up. Really interesting. Just one more footnote. You were a very diplomatic ambassador in describing President Zelensky not going off the rails with in terms of reforms. Dig a little deeper into that in terms of your view of that, because it's also very critical to our relationship with Russia, yeah. what happens internally, and what are some of the policy mechanisms that the Biden administration could use to get him back on the rails, to use your metaphor? 
you've seen a move away from over the course of the year, people who are pro-reform were replaced by others who are not so pro-reform. There's, I think, been a certain frustration that uh, they haven't taken steps to curb some of the outsized political and economic power of the oligarchs. Right. And part of this is institutional also. I mean, Tuzlonski, he's, for example, involved in a fight now with the constitutional court, where it does seem to be a certain core of that court has been captured by oligarch interests. Right. But I do think in terms of how Ukraine looks now, particularly when they're in conflict with Russia, you know, a conflict that Russia imposed upon them, right. they do see the United States as the main strategic partner. And that will give President Biden's voice in Kyiv a certain amount of weight. And, and he can use that. And, and then other things, looking at, for example, maybe conditioning certain aspects of American assistance on this comes, but you need to do this first. Right. That's sort of the approach of the International Monetary Fund. And it's unfortunate that we have to resort to that, but sometimes it's the only way to get politicians to do things which are difficult. Related to Ukraine and, and related to where you're sitting now, you wrote a piece in December about principles for sanctions policy towards Russia. Obviously, this is a central issue, has been in U.S.-Russia relations since 2014, when the Obama administration, in cooperation with Chancellor Merkel and the rest of the EU, imposed by the end of that year the most comprehensive sanctions against Russian individuals and companies in the history of U.S.-Russian relations. President Biden, in his inaugural address yesterday, didn't say much about foreign policy, but one thing he did t talk about was doing things in partnership with our allies. Sanctions is a complicated issue. You already mentioned Nord Stream 2, the new pipeline that Gazprom is seeking, has almost built to Germany, and now we have put in uh, new legislation to try to stop that. That happened right at the end of the Trump administration. Tell us a little bit about your own principles, but also the way you see this debate between Washington and Berlin yeah, and the rest yeah. of our allies about approach towards keeping sanctions in place or a different approach in the, in the new Biden era towards Russia. On the principles, one, I think sanctions need to be embedded in an overall policy. And the Trump administration may have had an overall Russia policy, but it was never articulated. Right. <laughs> and sanctions kind of seem to be out there, but you want to have it fit in a policy that has, yes, we're going to try to deter Russia, we're going to try to contain, but on these issues, we're going to do dialogue and sanctions are a tool. And, and I think that gets to the second point, which is sanctions are not an end in themselves. They're a tool to achieve a policy goal. Right. And, and be very clear that we are tying the sanction to a specific goal and I would argue only one goal. Sometimes I think there's a, maybe a tendency in Congress to say, well, we're going to sanction the Russians for this and this and this. Right. If you ask them to do three things to get the sanctions lifted, you know, you're know, you probably not going to succeed. And then the related point would be, it's important that there be clarity in Moscow and there be some certainty there that if they do the action you're asking them, that the sanction will in fact be lifted. Right. If not, the sanction you know, really loses its utility as a tool. Right. One other principle would be close coordination with Europe, particularly when you talk about economic sanctions, because in fact, the economic relationship between Europe and Russia is much larger than that between the United States and Russia. And that in some ways means that European sanctions can have some more bite. Now, Nord Stream 2, my, I look forward to talking to Germans about this in the next week or two. It's interesting because the pipeline is, I think, 93% complete. It's only got about 100 kilometers to go, but a pipeline that is only 93% is <laughs> better than a pipeline <laughs> that is not at all. <laughs> and you've had that, but not only, and this is where the Russians, I, I'm wondering what was going through the thought process, because the arrest of Navalny, as soon as he got off the airplane on Sunday, came just before there was going to be a discussion at the European Parliament. And it looks like the European Parliament is now going to vote to basically block the project. And you're having some political push now within Germany, elsewhere in Europe, triggered by the Navalny arrest saying, well, gee, should we really go through with this? It's going to be a fairly complex issue. I, I hope at the end of the day, we can figure out some mechanism because we, we want to make this an issue where we stop the pipeline or we get something really important for allowing to be completed. But we also want to manage it in a way so it doesn't become a big issue between Washington and Berlin. Right. You know, we want to maintain Western unity here on sanctions against the Russians and try to avoid issues which could, in fact, drive a wedge between us. But the Russians may be helping by their treatment of Navalny and by other actions by increasing 
domestic pressure within Germany that's saying, well, wait, maybe we ought not to complete this pipeline. That's really interesting. I, I also was thinking about that when they arrested Navalny, given all the other things they care about, especially with Germany and especially Nord Stream 2, that could turn out to be a very short-sighted move on Putin's part, but we'll see. This has been a fantastic conversation. Ambassador Pfeiffer, we're going to let you talk to some more Germans and get settled in your fellowship there. But we're also going to bother you again to give us an update, particularly on what is, you know, arguably one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world today between Germany and the United States for dealing especially with Russia, but also other countries like China and the rest of the world. So I hope you'll permit us to bother you again. But thanks for being on World Class today. I'll be happy to come again, and thanks very much for having me. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you liked what you're hearing, please review us on Apple Podcasts. We love to know your thoughts. And be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you're listening to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.